Have you already done one of these? Seriously? Ever. Oh. Huh. Yeah, you're going to get cir- cir- circuitous. You're going to be circulated. <laughs> so we were just up in uh, Middlebury, Shipshawana. And no, we were at the uh, Midwest Tool Expo. Put your headphones on and bring your bring your mic. We're already doing the podcast. I can read Check your check your mic. Okay. And check your cam. Look at your camera. (laughs) Oh my gosh, why is his lighting so good? Brett, you are so handsome. Look at that. (laughs) Look at you. Nice. Come up a little bit. Look at that. Put this like right here. He's like glowing. There, how's that? Is that good? No, because I can still see it in the (laughs) (laughs) Alright. Oh. So you were in... Chipshawana. We were in Shipshawana for the Midwest Tool Expo. Yeah, okay. Which is like an Amish tool uh, <laughs> expo. And it's all hand tools? It's not even close. <laughs> so many robots, wow. so much CNC. Uh, in Shipshawana, of all places. In Shipshawana. And, but unfortunately, we, got, we heard about the show kind of late, and so we uh, signed up late. And so while the... Uh, Midwest Tool Expo is happening where my phone is. The Health and Wellness Expo is where my cup is. And they decided to put me right here <laughs> at the entrance of the Health and Wellness Expo. <laughs> right next to the colon screening. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I had a, I, we were, you've been to trade shows, of I, course. I have. The, we were the last, we were in the last five booths right. of the, like, right. with no exit. So like you're out in the back 40 more or less. Yeah. We weren't even in the expo hall. We were in the hallway in front of the expo hall. So (laughs) they're like, how can hmm. we make more money? I don't know. We'll sell this hallway. Well, and then when I got there, uh, the guy, I was supposed to have outlets in my booth for equipment and stuff to show off and no power. And so this old Amish guy drives over and is like digging around back behind my neighbor's booth and like disconnecting all of his power and is just like, oh, we'll just take some of this. And then he turns <laughs> around and awesome. walks over and passes out and falls down and catches himself on the display booth next to me and knocks the whole thing. And I have to grab him and like hold him. And then he was like, oh, that was weird. And then he gets back on his little golf cart and takes <laughs> off. Like, Maybe you shouldn't be driving. Maybe you shouldn't be driving, but do you want me to call somebody? <laughs> yeah, I can call somebody. Uh, <sighs> so is this, yeah. this guy that collapses, is he even like part of the show? Yeah, no, he, he was the like event a coordinator. Oh, okay. Turned out later because I needed him <clears throat> later and he was very grumpy with me. Maybe his blood sugar was way off or something. Spike and then fell, you know? And it, but I walked up and he was like, I can't <laughs> help you. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm glad so, we paid for all of this. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, sir. We got very little traffic. What was I, why was I telling him that? You were in Shipshawana but what, at, up, up in Middlebury. Yeah, I know, but well, why did I tell you that? <clears throat> we were talking about podcast circuits, and then you went right into that. But oh, I, I, had a, I had a theme. That's, that's okay. That's okay. What was it about? You were handsome. We talked about that for a while. It's, it's the, the smile is what the... Uh, you you know, glowing. The, the lighting, right? You, you have a good... <laughs> you have good skin tone. You very, very... <clears throat> it's, a, it's a dirty skin tone, is how, uh, how I would describe <laughs> it. I'm like, I always look like I'm dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I am always dirty. I'm always surprised at how how blanco white I am once I like wash all the yeah, but grease like a, and stuff off like my face. You're like a daywalking ginger, right? I mean, so it's <laughs> what? <laughs> like you, I you am got not reddish ginger. You got like reddish. You got reddish hair. <laughs> I do not. Look at it, Evan. Back me up here. There's no red. Reddish. It's brown. It's mousy blonde. I, I can see where he's coming from. Oh my gosh, just a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so you have hints Podcast of being... Podcast over. Hints. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, you, you have you have hints of maybe being a Daylock mm-hmm. ginger or mm-hmm. inspired by. Mm-hmm. How's that? Inspired by. 
You know, like when you're making a particular <sighs> knife and it's like you're modeling it after something. And you're like, well, it's not really Japanese. It's Japanese inspired. It's Maybe it's Maybelline. Maybe it's Day Walking Ginger. You know, well, how did I get this <clears throat> pail? And I want to take time specifically to say congratulations because you've got another kid coming, Number right? five. Yes. Number five. Uh, my wife and I were like, we tapped at four. We're like, oh, Lord. <laughs> we tapped at four also. Oh. But. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I understand uh, that. You know, it's not a surprise. And I keep having people tell me that they refuse to explain to me why we keep having children. I know why we keep having children. I it's, understand. It's not, it's not lost on you. It's not lost on me. But <clears throat> at some point, I do feel like. We have a really fun family. Mm -hmm. and we live in a really cool house on, you know, gorgeous acreage with lots of animals. It's, it's a great place to grow up. Yeah, and, it sounds ideal. You know, it's kind of like at some point we need, well, we need people that have knowledge and experience and a go can do attitude. And so we're just going to make them. Yeah. You know, just going to make as many as we can before we have to stop. I, I grew up in Wisconsin on a river in my backyard, and behind it there was a doctor, and he owned like 100 acres. Mm -hmm. But like he had like a two-acre plot that his house was on, and it was yep. like two miles away. Yeah, yeah. So you could see it up on the hill, but he would never be down like where I was at. So yeah. as a kid growing up, I was just like hours in that woods. Oh, yeah. yeah. Destroying stuff. Yep. Being a boy. We had It was great. We had 100 like a 120 <clears throat> acre farm, but all the farms around us where I grew up in Ohio mm -hmm. always had a wood lot in the back to supply wood for the, for the furnace. And, uh, so we had a eighth of a mile lane in the front, our little block with the, the little farmhouse. There was a grain barn, a little like maintenance shed, and then a big like hayloft barn, you know? And, um, and then there was another eighth of a mile back and there was our probably five to 10 acre woodlot. It was oh, a big sweet. woodlot. Yeah. And um, so we would go back there and make tree houses. And yeah. one day I just was like, I really want to dig a hole. And so I went and <laughs> dug a six foot hole, five feet in diameter. Yeah. And the farmer came up to the house and was like, why? <laughs> it's like, I, I almost backed in your hole. And I was like, I don't, I don't know, man. I just needed to dig a hole today, you know? Uh, but, you know, I think it's all that young boy stuff, man. It's the young boy stuff. You got to climb a tree and knock it down. We built a, uh, a wigwam out of poison ivy by accident. <laughs> I got poison ivy. I was wearing a loincloth and built a poison You're ivy out wigwam. Out there doing the Ted Nugent thing? Yeah. That's yeah. probably a dated reference. So. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it. I don't okay. know who Ted Nugent is. Oh, man. <laughs> Sorry. But you can get <clears throat> to poison ivy in your lungs. If you didn't know that. I'm super allergic to this stuff. Like yeah. if I'm near it, like psh, I got it. It's yeah. crazy. And I think I probably have issues with it just because I was exposed to it so much yep. as a kid. Yep. Yep. It's one of those things that the more exposed you are to it, the more. So, so that's what I've heard because I, as a kid, I didn't ever get it when I was a teenager and I got super hyper exposed and it mm -hmm. got in my bloodstream and in my lungs and stuff. And they had me on all this stuff. Give you uh, steroids and sorts of prednisone crazy and stuff. Yep. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> they would coat me with calamine lotion. Um, but, uh, now I get it horribly. So yeah. my grandma would pull it barehanded and then just pour gasoline on her hands and move on. <laughs> it seemed to work for her. A different generation. Did they need something? Something happening? Yeah. It was Francis. He's coming back up. I think. Why is he coming up? I don't know. Is he trying to be on the podcast? He should this be on the podcast. This is a two-person podcast. He should totally be on this podcast. Third microphone. <sighs> yes. He's sick. Have you guys heard about the tuberculosis outbreak? No. There's an outbreak of tuberculosis. We what, had is this bunch, like the 1800s? I know. Well, they had a bunch of immigrants come over that had tuberculosis, and now it's spreading. Oh, and nobody's vaccinated for it because nope. it's like a... Because it was gone. Yeah. We eliminated tuberculosis. Oh, hey, there he is. Are you sick? I don't know. You need to play like walkout music. Like, are you? Do you need something? Or are you trying to be in the podcast? <laughs> there he is, the man, the myth, the legend, Francis Stroll. Everyone, I can't even hear him over the music. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I thought you guys had already started. So. Do I? Let me move over. 
See, look, I'm still kind of. You can be on the podcast, but you can't make any of us sick. Can you do that? Well, I'm not over there like deep kissing him or anything. Good yet, yet. <laughs> you've never been on a podcast. You've already been going also, about how handsome Brett is. <laughs> also true. Also true. <laughs> Not entirely. Let's come over here and sit down. Be Grab lazy. a chair. There's a chair behind Brett. There's a chair behind Brett. Hey, there's a chair are, behind me. Are you telling me that you haven't been recording all of this? I have been. Okay. It's all usable. It's all great. Well, I know. Especially this part. This That's what I'm really saying. Funny. Yeah, this is going to go great. People love it when we do this. Nice big transition into something else. <laughs> careful. Careful. Hey, Francis. Hi. <laughs> Too much of the uh, three dollar Chuck last night from uh, <laughs> Trader Joe's, or I don't know what that means. <laughs> Chuck, like ground Chuck? Yeah. No, it's a. It's a. But not close enough to make him sick. Snuggle in, snuggle in. Okay. Stomach flu. No, um, you buy that three dollar bottle of wine from like Trader Joe's. Oh no, that's the surprising part. Is I haven't been drinking at all for like weeks. So this is. Legitimate. Yeah, this is like... Maybe it is tuberculosis. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Did you know that there are words to the chicken dance? What? I don't want to be a chicken. I don't want to be, be a duck. duck. I just want to shake my butt. I, I forget so the I transition, my butt. so I shake my butt. Yeah. So the song, the chicken dance is about how... You're melting my face. She right doesn't want to be a chicken. Or a duck. Or a duck. She but, just wants to shake her so butt. She shakes her. Why is it a she? Why is the proverbial non-chicken oh, want to be or a she? It's a not chicken a dance, not a rooster dance. It's not a they dance. But chicken is a <laughs> it's an overarching <laughs> spectrum of both hens and roosters. Oh, chicken refers that, to both. That ref that's a fair point. Is a rooster a chicken? It is, my friend. Evan, <laughs> this wasn't my idea. <laughs> I feel like I talked you into it. And I, and I apologize. Mm -hmm. I, is there is there some tension? Yeah, some so tension much. Here? Always. <laughs> we haven't kissed in years. Yeah, it's been a minute. <laughs> we don't sleep in, in the wow. same bed anymore. Or on the same garage floor. I think I have a video of drunk Francis watching TikTok in his underwear laughing hysterically that on is my correct. phone. First yes. of all, it's not TikTok. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have TikTok. Oh, okay. Second of all, you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> what video was that? Uh, that was Blade Show. I know it was Blade Show, but what <laughs> video was I wasn't that drunk. I was like, I had had like no, two yeah. or three beers. It was like three in the morning, and my wife's like, who is texting you yeah. at three in the morning? And I'm like, I don't know. And I was like, boop. And I'm like, I oh, had casual, casual beers and had worked 12 hours at Blade Show that yeah. day. So genuinely like. Drunk with exhaustion. Yeah. Just peopled out. Brad, have you ever been to Blade Show? <laughs> I have never been to Blade Show. Um, initially, when I started paying attention, I wanted to go to Blade Show. But every time we have Blade Show, we have a family get together. Oh, so for Got that it. for that yeah. <clears throat> that weekend, so it's just never worked out for me timing wise. Yeah, it's wild. It's overwhelming. Uh, it's we have since like two years ago. Well, maybe even more than that. We have stopped doing that. So okay. now, now I have now I have the time, but yeah. Yeah, I just haven't will. haven't gone yet. Yeah. And I think I would rather go as just like a dude walking through the oh, door yeah. and enjoying it. Yep. Versus like I have to buy a table and now I have to sell, you know. It would be so much fun to just go. X amount of knives. But working to, it is. Yeah. I think there was oh. eighteen or nineteen thousand people last year. I thought it was in the twenties. Was it in the 20s? I thought it was in the, the last 20s. show I went to was eighteen. Five. It would be okay. beneficial to get your work in front of a lot of people. So like maybe sure. network and gain some exposure that way, but well, but At then the same you have time, to, I'm like, man, I don't then know. Then you have to worry about if you're getting your, your knife in front of the right type of knife collector, right? right. So, like, if you're next to Bob Dozier and you make super fancy tactical knives, it's not going to work out for you. Because right. all of Bob's fans want, like, hunting knives. So, I've talked to a friend of mine in the past, and he's like, hey, don't attend the show. Just go to the pit afterwards and bring all your knives and sell them there. Hmm. And I, I've 
since learned that that's like majorly frowned upon, yeah. I guess. I would, I would assume, assume so. But <laughs> I, I had worked out in my head, I was going to moto camp. I was going to uh -huh. ride my motorcycle down. And then there's a Chuck E. Cheese just down the road. <laughs> yeah. the and behind that Chuck E. Cheese, there's a power substation and like a whole wooded lot. And I was okay. like, I'm just going to camp there for, for oh like gosh. two days out yeah. of my motorcycle and go to the show is at that, night. Is that the same... Uh, strip that that Philly cheesesteak place was in sure is yeah the the this is heresy but the best Philly cheesesteak I've ever had was it's in, in Atlanta Georgia a strip mall in Atlanta Georgia okay that's, that's why we were also starving and we walked like a mile to get there <laughs> <laughs> maybe you just need to work for you your food really earned that cheesesteak <laughs> okay <laughs> but uh that was my plan yeah and then um my kid god bless him he pulls me aside and he's like dad this is nuts he's like you're gonna get beat up by like railroad bums and stuff. <laughs> there was a, a train track back there. And he's like, there's absolutely homeless people. And he's like, if I was a police officer and saw you back there, I would 100% like pull up on you with full spotlights and like hassle you until you left. Where'd you get the bike? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not here for Blade Show. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Unfortunately, you would Sleeping be one in a of hammock. the most normal attendier, attendees <laughs> to Blade Show. I would say the, the, the comp, the, like the, complicated part about trade shows in general that we've kind of run into is kind of figuring, trying to figure out and identify what, what are we going to accomplish? You know, we've mm -hmm. had the same struggle at maker camp. It's like, what, what are we trying to do while we're here? What are we, you know, cause we don't really go to trade shows to sell things per se. We go to trade shows to interact and talk to people. Right. Network and I mean, right. build, build your, um, you know, like your business image or whatever. Yeah. And I think, <clears throat> you know, especially for a small knife maker, they're probably going to sell, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's the, the opportunity of the show is the selling. The, the networking for a single knife maker, I would, I would argue is like, you might make some friends, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I've never gone to a show to sell. We should have Matt. We should talk to Matt about it. Because I think Matt is that perfect demographic of like. Which Matt? Matt Hartwick. Like mm. some people know his name. Yeah. And he's gotten connected with people. Yeah. Is Blade Show worth it for him? Because yeah. he had a lot of knives left over, but he also sold a few. Right. So I don't know if that made his trip worth it or not. I've been doing artisan markets yeah. out around the Valparaiso area. Mm. Holy, <sighs> holy cow. Mm. Um, another maker, Ben Graber, he has, mm -hmm. a, yeah. he has a 16 ton. Yeah. He got me hooked up with these people and we started doing a show at the Journeyman Distillery. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, you know, I'm used to like the one day art fair stuff. So that's what I bring. And he brings like all these high end, like Damascus, as nice as he can make them kitchen knives and, and hunting knives and stuff. And I've yeah. got like this, you know, railroad spike knife, like <laughs> junk, right? And and it works for us because he has all this like really nice stuff that yeah. he has priced to like two fifty, three hundred dollars. And I've mm -hmm. got stuff that's like fifty bucks. Right. And uh I've never sold so much stuff in my life at yeah. a market ever. In the last three or four markets I've done with him, holy cow. You could almost make really? it. I would, if you were busy enough, I think if you hit a few of those markets out in the Valparaiso, Portage, Chesterton area, yeah, there's a lot of disposable income. I mean, those people are killing it. I'm I, not familiar with Valparaiso. What, what kind of demographic? Like, would you compare it to, are you familiar with like Noblesville, Carmel, Westfield, it's, prob it's like probably more like um, somewhere between a Carmel and a Westfield would be okay. my guess. Okay. I'd say Greenwood. <clears throat> it's Greenwood. Greenwood. Yeah, yeah, all the all the people have moved out of Illinois because the taxes yeah. are ridiculous, yeah. and uh, they moved into Indiana up in that corridor up there because yeah. it's yep. cheap living. Yep. And they're like, oh, what? I can buy like a half a million dollar house here for like two hundred and fifty thousand yep. dollars. I'm doing that. Yeah. Right. Also, feel free to plug Journeyman any point during the podcast. We back them hard. Yeah. They have, was, they have they've been me. fantastic to work a, with. A with lavender these. gin and egg white drink. That is fantastic. <laughs> Francis, uh, you are continually leaning into the their, camera. Their Detroit-style <laughs> pizza is delicious. Oh, yeah. And they also have a, like, blueberry jam, bacon, and blue cheeseburger that is fantastic. They have that distillery up in – I'm sorry, let me move this way. They have this distillery up in Three Oaks, Michigan. Yep. And it was like an old flour factory or something yep. like that. And now they opened up a gigantic space in Valpo. Cool. So we've done two markets at the one in Three Oaks, and we just did one in, I've in only Valpo. I've been to the one in Michigan. And uh, my brother-in-law is a connoisseur of uh, like whiskey and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I got him like, I'm like, hey, just give me your basic whiskey. He called me, and he never calls, right? <laughs> this is amazing. And I'm like, uh, yeah. okay. 
Like yeah. it's like 20 minutes from my house, man. It, you know, it's kind of like, man, what can I get them? Oh, they do it journeyman's right. over here. I'm going yeah. to go yeah. grab them some it's whiskey. Fantastic. I've never heard of it. That's where me and Al used to go all the time. Mm. Why are you smiling Sorry. like that? Who's Al? X. Oh. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not a big deal. <laughs> so should we start the podcast well, at it, any it point? It started. Yeah. We're in it. We're, we're already in it. With, so with your... Uh, with selling it at your like markets. So yeah. I have a lot of friends that are farmers that go to the markets that say it's not worth it because there's it's, so much overlap, but yeah. I'm guessing with blacksmithing and tools and knives, like, right. So we, no were, we were doing this show and there was like 150 vendors yeah. at, in Valpo. That's it, was, a big, it was bonkers. Yeah. That's a big event. We were the only knife related smithing related booth there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they sell alcohol because sure. it's a distillery. Right. And we literally had guys just hanging out in our booth. And they're yeah. like, I don't know, my wife's around here somewhere. <laughs> they're like, hey, we, we just want to hang out in the cool booth. And we're yeah. like, ah, okay, you know, we're like in a 10 by 10 space. And we have thir right. 13 guys drinking in our booth <laughs> talking oh to God. us about knives Handling and blacksmithing. Knives. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like shoulder to shoulder people. And yeah. Like, uh, would you be able to do like live demonstrations on site or would that be too dangerous, do you think? Like, would they let you <clears> do it essentially? We've worked with the guy who sets all this stuff up mm -hmm. enough. David Reagan, I think is his name. Super good guy, right? Uh, I think if we presented him with like, hey, if we can get 220 yeah. and a induction forge in there, mm. he for sure would be like, yeah, let's do it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That would be the, super the, cool. The deal breaker is the induction forge because yeah. you, I don't think we could probably have an open flame in there. Well, what about, I mean, there is there a parking lot? Yeah. We've done parking lot stuff. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do they do I've they have lot stuff to people do they, God bless it. do they have people like cooking and yeah. doing barbecue and stuff because yeah. that's open flame right mm -hmm. yeah but it's in a like you know regulated kitchen area oh it's not like we it's can not out. The 10 year old kids rolling by like grabbing yeah. stuff right oh careful right. that's like 1300 degrees i i've just found like <laughs> when we've gone to shows when i i mean i grew up doing shows uh all around the all around the midwest and the uh the response, if somebody can watch you make something, they will buy it. 100%. The issue that we run into, I think, is that there's just a lot of people that just stand there because they want to watch what you're doing. Yeah, oh, yeah. They're not going to invest in anything that you're making. Oh, absolutely. Right. They're intrigued. Like, oh, wow, what's going right. on here? These well, especially if you brought an induction forge. They would, like, yeah. lose their mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people yeah. would, yeah. At Blade I, I, Show, I the I first induction forge that we <clears> took to Blade Show, we literally had dozens and dozens and dozens of, of people just standing like, yeah. Can you explain to me what I just watched? Yeah, wizard magic. Yeah, it is wizard <laughs> magic. That's the best way to explain it. I think uh, I'm. I'm just kind of curious about like Brett. Where Where are you on your journey? Where did you start? Ooh. Oh, we you? actually started the podcast. We are actually into the. Oh, podcast. okay. <laughs> where there did you no start your journey uh, with uh, with metalworking in general? And kind of tell us about how you ended up where you're at today. Um. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I got in involved in metalworking because and it's going to seem like kind of far-fetched, but I did a lot of endurance events and distance running. And uh, through that, my wife and I ended up being race directors of a local half marathon, marathon, and I believe a 60K. We all ran them at the same time. Yeah. And <clears throat> we're giving people like for first place an eight dollar plastic trophy. <laughs> <as they Yeah. laughs> like, hey, thanks for running for five and a half hours straight. <laughs> Enjoy this plastic trophy and all the you know all yeah. the bragging rights that it goes with it. So, yeah. uh, her and I immediately were like, hey, we gotta we gotta up our game. Um, we gotta figure something out. So everybody I talked to, they're like, hey, we don't care what it is as long as it's handmade. Mm. And uh, I went and looked at like all these other like marathons and 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 ultra marathons that had like handmade stuff. Yeah. And like, none of it spoke to me. I'm like, oh, this stuff is stupid. Nobody's going to want this stuff. This stuff, you know, you can go buy this stuff off of Etsy or whatever. Right. Um, and then I saw a railroad spike knife and I'm like, well, what does a railroad spike cost? And then I'm like, well, what does it cost to set up a forge? And then I'm like a YouTubing stuff. And I'm like, well, heck yeah, I'm doing that. <laughs> so I'm in my garage <laughs> with like a, a four or five brick setup. Yeah. And a propane torch in the side yeah. with a pair of a vice grips and a piece of railroad track. I love it. And I sit down and like, it takes me two weeks to make one. Yeah. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just heating metal up and I'm literally just beating the blazes out of it with a right. hammer. And um, if you ever use railroad track as an anvil, mm -hmm. it rings like a bell. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So when you hit it, it's like yeah. huge ring. 
So after about, I don't know, six months of that, making these railroad spike knives, my neighbors literally come over to my house. They're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, what do you mean what am I doing? I'm like, I'm blacksmithing. They're like, you're what? And I'm like, yeah, check it out. I'm like making knives and stuff. And I'm like, oh, can, can you guys hear this? And they're like, everybody can hear it. <laughs> like, could you stop at like eight o'clock at night? Cause I can still hear your anvil in my house. Oh my God. And then like, I'm like, mm. and I really like my neighbors. Yeah. yeah. They're super cool. Yeah. I went back in the house. I'm like, Hey, neighbors came over and they said they can hear everything we're doing. She's like, everybody can hear it. It's so loud. I'm like, ah. <laughs> uh, so I went from making railroad spike knives for finisher awards to now I've moved into a, um, a slumlord's two car garage <laughs> that, that I'm like, I kind of have like this. Are you the slumlord? No, <laughs> no, your garage? no it's, a, it's a friend of mine. He wouldn't mind me calling him a slumlord. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I now move out to the West side of South Bend. It's like the worst part of town. Yeah. I'm in a two car garage that I can't lock. <laughs> right. Great. It's like the, the, the door lock is literally a bolt that you just stick in sure. the hole and the yeah. door stays shut. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and my wife's like, you're an idiot. They're going to steal all your stuff. I never had a problem when I was there. Yeah. Like ever. But um, he had a two-car garage that he would clean, and then I would, well, we would clean it together. But I would work in that space, and then a couple, I don't know, days later, I'd come back, and he'd have more stuff in the space we just cleaned. So that cycle happened like five or six times. Finally, I'm like, all right, I got to so figure Nathan something out. Nathan was the slumber. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I go and I Google, right, like uh, Indiana Blacksmith Association. I'm yeah. like, oh, cool, they have satellites. Oh, there's a yep. map. And I click on the map, and I'm looking, I'm like, well, shoot, that house is like three miles away from mine. Yeah. It's just down the road. So I just roll in there like on a Saturday yeah. with like a pail full of stuff. Yep. And I walk into the shop and uh, Bill Conyers, he's the former VP of um, Indiana Blacksmith Association. Okay. Old school guy, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Tough love. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anybody who's dealt with him knows Bill. Um, I walk in and he's busy uh, in the back doing something. And he looks up and he's like, who are you? And I'm like, uh, well, I'm, I'm here for the hammer in. And he's like, there's no hammer in today. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, all right. And he, he like goes back to working and I'm like standing alone in his shop. And he's ignoring, <laughs> completely ignoring me and he's oblivious. So I'm standing there for like 15 minutes, right? And finally I'm like, all right, well, I, I guess I'll leave. And as I'm turning to leave, he goes, what's in the pail? And he yells it from across the shop. And I yeah. set it down. I'm like, well, I make knives. Because we don't make knives here. <laughs> it's a blacksmith shop. I'm like, uh, okay. So then he like turns all of his stuff off and walks over and he's, if you ever seen him, he looks like the grumpy guy from the movie Up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a carbon copy. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Anyway. Uh, so I hand him one of the railroad spike knives that I was like the most proud of. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, I'm making railroad spike knives. And I hand it to him. And he looks at it. And he like flips it over, hands it back to me. And he goes, it's terrible. And he goes, <laughs> he, he walks back to the back where he was working, turns everything back on and starts working again. <laughs> And I'm like, ah, oh, that's not what I expected. So yeah. uh, from that point on, I wanted to try and make the best knife possible for uh, my skill set. Sure. So like every railroad spike knife from that time forward was like the best of my ability, yeah. which probably wasn't great. Right. But um, every every one since then, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there, that, that is the first one. That's fantastic. Uh, is that the one that he said is terrible? Uh, no, that was that was the number one. Okay. And I've tried to buy it back from the, I gave it to a friend of mine. Yeah. And I literally, I'm like, hey, I'll buy it back from you. And he's like, no, I'm keeping it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you jerk. <laughs> you know, because I was going to destroy it. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Go bury it in the backyard somewhere. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, so it's just been a slow progression. And then um, the guys there at the shop taught me pattern welding. Okay. And it started with um, wrought iron that they got from, Tipton. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got wrought iron and O1, and we learned how to forge weld in a coal fire. Yep. Which is crazy. Totally different process. Though. Right. Yeah. 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 So we're, I learned forge welding. And then at that time, Bill, who runs the shop and owns the shop, is doing a continuing education. Sorry, I'm talking with my hand. Uh, he does continuing education with the local steel mill. So all the maintenance guys come down and they do continuing education and learn blacksmithing in his shop. That's awesome. That's and the, so sick. And the, and, yeah, and the steel mill pays for them to have yep. classes with him. So he wants to do a pattern welding class, so he does a Damascus class. Yeah. And how Bill prepares for a Damascus class is he just buys a book and reads it. And then sure. he goes out and does it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. that's just how he operates. I'm like, oh, all right. And uh, he's like, hey, I'm teaching these guys how to make Damascus. Are you interested? I said, yeah. He's like, well, okay. 
I'm not letting them throw any of their ruined billets away. There's a, five ga- a couple five gallon pails here of ruined Damascus billets. Mm. So when they screw it up, they put it in this pail. It's like class is over. You can have that stuff. If you can fix it and learn how to reforge well that and make it into like something viable, you can mm. have it. Mm. So I spent a year per pail. So it's like maybe two years of just going through like mangled yeah. Damascus that was all delaminated and stuff and trying yeah. to figure out how to like reforge weld it all together. Yeah. So from a problem solving standpoint, that put me like way ahead yeah, with right. the, with pattern welding. Right. Cause I actually didn't have never bought like material and did the cut and stack thing. Right. It was always just some mangled mass yep. that I'm trying to s- stick back together. Working out of the ashes. Of, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. What, what once was. So once you got to making Damascus, fixing Damascus, right? <laughs> right repairing, yeah. rebuilding it. Yeah, yeah. Then, <clears throat> I mean, through this whole process, what was sustaining in, in holding your interest well, to the craft? To, to, to be honest, um, when I started making like the railroad spike knives and stuff, I was in it to try and make cheap awards for, for <laughs> rights, right? Yeah, right. But what I found along the way was this process um, for me is like super satisfying. Yeah. And I, I decided that I'm going to pursue this as far as it'll go mm-hmm. and learn as much as I can, not because I feel like it's going to make me rich or famous or any right. of that stuff, because it's never even in my mind that that's even a possibility. Yeah. I just started doing it because at the end of the day, it made me feel whole, you know? Mm. Yeah. Uh, I work in an office setting and um, some days that's really not satisfying. Oh, yeah. So then you come home and like make something with your hands right. that was potentially just scrap steel and you make something cool out of it. That's so rewarding for me. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, that's the top. So. Nathan's had three or four office days in the past two weeks. <laughs> 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 Where like, you, uh, we don't see him on the floor. And I'll have to go back and ask him a question. And at about 3.30, I go back there and he is just zoned out, staring into space. Yeah. And one of the days he was like, I have to go make something. And yeah. just it, it gets, went and gets started a forge. Yeah. Like, it was... It, it, there's a, yeah, there's a point where when you work an office job, everybody kind of clings to tiny accomplishments throughout the day. Like yesterday was frustrated with, uh, the way that a couple of the inductions were going together with a couple of the fittings, but it was really cool. Cause I got to fix that, right? Like the, you don't get that in a spreadsheet. So to be able to go home, <laughs> 100%, yeah, yeah. To, to be able to go home and, and mangled Damascus becomes something better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that accomplishment, if you're a blacksmith shop or you're, you're a knife shop or whatever you have in your garage, if it pays for itself, you're incredibly lucky. The goal isn't to, to be if rich. I can break, if I can break even, I'm happy. Yeah, And exactly. I'm at the point in my life where, you know, I want to continue learning. So I want to mm-hmm. try and make enough money just to pay for that learning. That's it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's it. And as long as I can do that, I'm, I'm in a space right now where that, that works just fine. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Prior to me making the railroad spike knives, I was really into hot rods and motorcycles, all that stuff, like very hands-on. Yeah. But like smithing is like a whole different level of metallurgy and like fabrication and stuff. So much more satisfying. Um, I took like maybe five years and I built a tea bucket. Okay. With a small block Chevy in my, in my garage. Yeah. With a crappy little Harbor Freight welder and stuff. (laughs) And it's just like I'm piecing stuff together. They're like, what's that from? I'm like, well, that's a Ford Ranger. And, uh, you know, over here I've got, you know, it's just crazy conglomeration of parts. Right. And, uh, I got to the point for me where it just wasn't satisfying working on it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like, I just want this thing to be done so I can get out of my life. (laughs) And I sold it and got out of my garage and, uh, you know, got out of the doghouse with the missus. So that was great. (laughs) You know, she, uh, She's like so happy it was gone. And then, oh, and then I started smithing and then she's yeah. like, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> you got rid of all this stuff and now you're like getting an anvil and stuff. I'm like, yeah. Oh yeah, this is great. Yeah, absolutely. It's the yeah. Ne- well, Will Stelter is working on that, uh, old international flatbed truck and he texted Logan and he was like, what year is it? Oh, I think it's like a 67. Oh, cool. He's like working on trucks is so much easier than blacksmithing. He's like, I can just like go to a website and order the stuff that I need. Yeah. No. It's like, not only order what that. you need, you can look up what you need. Right. So it's like somebody else has probably worked this, on it. This Nobody is the else problem. rebuilt a <laughs> 300 pound Bradley, you know, or Baudry or whatever hammer he has. Uh, so him rebuilding that was like, you know, <laughs> he had to make it himself. That's cute though. That is a, uh, an international yep. off, of a, mm-hmm. off of a tractor. Yep. It looks like a Model M. I cut it in the middle and I stretched it four inches and I welded a piece back in and then I had it painted. Yep. That was it, man. 
Was it fun though? Oh, once it was, it was done? That thing was so awesome when it ran. Yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> when it ran. Yeah. Oh, that's so fun. I did a, uh, a cowhide seat. Yeah. 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 Did that you was, like make the cowhide seat? Uh, I made the pan for the seat okay. and I took the cushion off of like a early nineties caravan Yeah, and I've made it fit the pan and then yeah. I took it to, uh, like a, an upholstery shop, upholstery shop yeah. that does stuff for like boats and stuff yeah. up in Elkhart. Yep. And they just stitch it together. She's like, Oh, this is awesome. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> it's, it's just a lot of money. <laughs> Can you say that to my wife? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's super fun. Oh yeah. Have you ever seen, uh, there's a famous rat rod and the guy, uh, took the airbag out of the steering wheel and welded a buoy knife. It's like, <laughs> if we die, we die like men. Like, Holy smokes. Sick. <clears throat> okay. So yeah, you, in the middle of your steering wheel is just a freaking yeah. Five inch knife. So that'd be fun. You know, not really a little no. fender. Ah, <laughs> <fender. laughs> uh, man, that gives me the wheelies. Yeah, no. So you're going through, you are getting exposed to the community of blacksmithing, right? You're getting right through the IBA through right. the IBA. You're getting kind of into the mix of your local and community too. Just about everything I've learned from a smithing standpoint, as yeah. far as how the metal moves and how to make a knife, yeah. I've learned it from the guys from the IBA. Okay. Which seems kind of weird because they were very much like they're on not, record. Like we're not knife makers. Yeah. Right. Right. So I learned that smithing aspect from them, but like yeah. actually making it a pretty knife and yeah. Uh, the fittings and how to do a particular Damascus. Sorry, I, I've, I think I found that. <laughs> Producer Evan's getting real good at wow. this Google stuff. Oh. Bro. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just, no. Yeah. No. Uh, so, so I've learned that from them. Yeah. So uh, when I went and did a mosaic Damascus class down in Missouri, mm -hmm. the whole forge welding thing. Yeah. Piece of cake. Sure. The uh, the whole forge out the knife from this billet, mm -hmm. piece of cake. Right. Uh, let's make it into, you know, this kind of buoy knife. I'm like, uh, handles, fittings, what? You know, yeah. just trying mm -hmm. to figure all that stuff out because yeah. that's super technical. Right. Well, it's a whole different skill set. Yes. Like, it, yes. It, I feel like when you move from, and I'm not a knife maker, but when you move from the forging, grinding, heat treating, like the blade finishing process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you almost have to take <clears throat> your blacksmith hat off and put your machinist or what a jeweler hat on and then go to your bench and, and I, yeah. I just don't do that. You know, like that's it, why I like, like it, handled it, tools <laughs> that I can like you forge it yeah. and then you take a handle and you just hammer it into the hole and it's like, there's something to be said for that. Cause it makes yeah. it super easy. Uh, yeah. Zach Royer is another one of those guys. He yeah. says he doesn't want to be a knife maker because it's just too much time finishing, mm -hmm. but he makes an amazing ax. He makes an amazing tomahawk and yeah. he makes amazing hammers. Yeah. And he's got the setup for it, man. Yeah. And he, it, same thing. He just doesn't want to spend hours hand sanding and yep. making stuff fit with no gap and all that stuff. It's not his yeah. jam. I get that. Zach's up there next to you, right? Yeah. yeah. And then his, his, his shop's guess. amazing. Yeah. He's got a big Anyang in there, like a 110. Yeah. And he, uh, he built a hydraulic press that's like 10 feet tall, eight feet tall. <laughs> we, we don't talk about that on here. <laughs> Oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> I'm, just I'm just kidding. He's kidding. Yeah. No, he he yeah. made it. I know he made exactly. a, Yeah, Zach's a good guy. He, he comes to huge, soap every year with yeah. you, right? Yeah, he made a huge oh. press, and then uh, he made it so big so he could fit his drift in there. Yeah, uh -huh. he has a big handle, big handle yep. drift. So it's like a almost like a two foot long drift. Right. Right. So he just takes it while it's drifted and just sets it in there and yep. pushes it, yeah. pushes it through. Yeah, he's yeah. thought all this stuff out. Yeah, and he has an unlimited like his scrap pile is amazing. Like if there's any like crazy steel that I need, like yeah. I just bought some inch and a half thick plate steel from uh -huh. him. And I'm like, hey, you know, I'm just checking. I'm trying to build this stand for this anvil. Wondering if you've got some, uh, you know, one inch plate. He's like, I got some inch and a half and some two. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> inch and a half will probably work. <laughs> yeah. And so he sends me the dimensions and it's like perfect. Yeah. You know, and he he's a great resource. And yeah. he's a really good smith as well. So That's awesome. This is his work? Yeah. Super cool. You've talked to him at Sofa. Oh, I'm sure. A bunch of times. I'm sure. I uh, don't remember people. Okay. Um, he is a very large person. <laughs> uh, he's 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 very tall, and I mean, yeah. just dimensionally, he's just a big burly dude. Yeah. I um, do not think I have ever spoken with him. Yeah, there's the Anyang. 
that thing is scary. He he has the Anyang set up where the treadle is like 14 inches off the ground. Yeah. And he doesn't use a block or anything. That's, he, he just puts his foot on the ground and then yeah. he just uses his toe and feathers it in. See, Logan's got his uh, no nasal set up where you have to put your foot up yeah. on it yeah. and then rest it on the 10 by 10 oak block and you, you control it with your heel. Okay. I just put yeah. a little step on it. Right. What? He's like, no, I don't like it. Uh, yeah, I went and got but like um, so hard to use. Derek Melton's little um, swage swage block, mm -hmm. and I put it on the floor, and I'm like, yep. put it put it on my heel. <laughs> and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I can't control this thing because it's like a hair trigger on yeah, those yeah. Anyangs. It's mm -hmm. like, holy smokes! Yeah, smash everything. I mean, it's awesome, but I have no control. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, personally, going back to your comment about everything you've learned has been through the IBA. I think the IBA is a re ridiculously good group. Oh, I do too. I, I, I do haven't too. gone and visited all the other ones, but I just feel like with Steve King and Jeff Reinhardt and Jeff Williams and like yeah, Kurt, the, Kurt that you had Kurt here a couple like, of weeks ago. My, yeah. The knowledge and the depth of like, it's just overwhelming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're so freely giving it away. You know, every time they come. Angrily giving it away. <laughs> every time <laughs> they come <laughs> and teach. I mean, Bill Corey was here, for, you know, teaching people to forge weld in the induction forge. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Henderson was teaching people how to forge axe. I mean, everybody was just sweating their faces off. Yep. Just teaching people. And then they, they won't let wonderful. us buy them lunch. No. That's my favorite thing about them is we'll, go, that we'll have them out. We'll say, hey, guys, you know, we'll, we'll buy you lunch. We'll, we'll do these things for you. And they'll just say. No, I already bought lunch. <laughs> I'm a grown man. Yeah. Leave me alone. I had fun today. Thank you. you and then to, they just leave. <laughs> you know? Trying to buy me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah no. The the amount of of knowledge and like you said the 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 wealth of knowledge that teaching that comes from them with absolutely yeah. zero expectation. Yeah. Yeah. I've never experienced that in any community, including blacksmithing and bladesmithing. Well, the the knife making outside community, of IBA. The knife making community is like this is my pro proprietary yeah, right. thing and right. like. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I will help you up until a certain point, but right. then after that, you just need to figure it out. Yeah, you know? that's the point that they differentiate themselves from their peers, right? They, yeah. They, did I think? <clears throat> I think there's some some truth to that. It, you know, I'm not posting CAD models of our parts on the inter internet, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I uh, will regularly get into the forums on Facebook and teach people about the difference between a four and a five inch cylinder and why we run at these pressures and why you yeah. want to use this kind of pump. And like, because ultimately it supports the community. Yeah. And if we can teach more people how to be blacksmiths and expose the greater general populace to blacksmithing 100%. And, and all of the fulfillment <clears throat> and satisfaction that comes with it, I think genuinely, we have the size of blacksmith community that we have now because people don't know. They don't mm -hmm. even know that it's an option. I mean, you kind of said the same thing. Like, yeah. I could just go make those? Like, yeah. Oh, and you went and built a fire brick forge and started forging. Right. And, and just knowing that the door is open to them because everyone knows they can go out and be a woodworker <laughs> as a hobby. <laughs> yeah, they right. know, they just, you just grow up knowing that. But I don't think people realize how accessible it can be. And how absolutely fulfilling and yeah. satisfying it can be to dive in both hands, both feet into a blacksmithing and forging and knife making and all of it. I totally agree. Um, I had a foray into woodworking <laughs> and um, it just sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's so splintery. Yeah, it's, well, yeah. Every time I leave with this huge freaking splinter in I my mean, hand was, that I can't get it was, out. It was okay, but yeah. you know, it's not... You're not taking Promethean fire and beating <laughs> Elman fire and like literally beating it yeah. in, into submission. You're not doing yeah. any of that. You're just like, oh, I'm just going to go over here and, you know, shave a shave an inch I, off of this and then fit this together. And it's like so much more elegant than what yeah, I, I smithing think is. There's a, I think one of the things that's held my interest in blacksmithing for so long is there's an immediacy to, to metalworking. Yeah. I mean, think of like welding <clears throat> two pieces of, of like, I need to build a box. You weld the corners and it's welded, right? Mm -hmm. It's done. But if I need to build a box in wood, I've got to shape the corners mm. in a way that I can get mechanical fastening. And then I've got to use glue and wait until it sets up with 56 clamps on it. And it's like, <laughs> it's a whole different, and maybe yeah. that's just because I hate being, you know, having to wait slow and waiting. Yeah. But I've always found like, I can really push through fabricating and building and fabric cobbling my ideas into reality, even if it's just for that first draft. Um, like we're, we're working on a secret project right now where 
Uh, I want, I'm, I know, I want to bring in, there are, there are no U.S. manufacturers for a certain product. Okay. And I found that out and I was flabbergasted because there's really only about three or four other companies in the world that are producing It's also this. like a really American product. When you think about Amen, Americana, brother. when you think about Americana, this is somewhere in that setting. Hell Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> we, I was like, well, surely we can figure this out. Yeah. And so, you know, I did my first draft of the idea, built the first die set in CAD, and I was looking at the price to put that cat, that die set together. And I'm like, well, that's kind of expensive. And so Logan was like, oh, dude, just do it. Like, like remove these couple things and we'll just, we'll just build a, a slower version for the first one. So we, we are putting together a die set for like a fifth of the price of the complicated die set, just to prove out the idea. Like, oh, proof, can proof, this proof, form? Yeah. Right. And I think they call that like, stop it. This and is, I, this is I secret, think only you can see that. I, I, uh, ha I have that. Well, well now, now we have okay. to beep so it. Now, <laughs> now oh. we have to beep it. Well, so I, if I you're going to beep it, so Sorry. we are, <laughs> we are going to be stamping. <laughs> Sorry, Evan. All of the, <laughs> so we built it to stamp the, and we're stamping them out of steel. That's two or three. <laughs> so much beeping. So you can't even say two it. or so three beeping. times the thickness. So the, the itself weighs almost a pound. Oh, fantastic. And the nearest yeah. competitor, which is out of Poland, their weighs five ounces with So mine's gonna weigh 16 ounces before we put on. And the 22 pound that I showed you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next closest competitor <laughs> on the high end. 22 pounds. But Did I not show you that? No, it's a weightlifter's so, It so literally weighs like 22 Three pounds. or four years ago, they, some is company that also made from a, Poland? I don't Maybe know some it. some company Yuck, made an April Fool's <laughs> joke about having a weightlifter's or, or something, and this year a company actually made it and is selling it. It's for pre-order right now. I may or may not have pre-ordered one. Yeah, the twenty-two pound pre-order now. Yeah, it's literally just m machined out of a solid block of stainless steel. Yeah, holy crap! Did you actually order one? I said may or may not. He for sure did. Look at him. Look at him. I don't Look have children. Face. You got a <laughs> or a car payment. <laughs> I do what I want. You gotta, oh. you gotta make sure that you switch arms so you're like one arm isn't like <laughs> jacked and huge and the other one's like I hate <laughs> out of my left hand. I've I don't know why no, like that motion with my left hand does not feel the same as drinking. We learned something about the motion of your hands yesterday though. I cannot. Yeah, wait but I also filled the coil out. faster. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you you appreciate Sorry. cars, so I have to show this to you. Okay, cool. Uh, I found this yesterday <laughs> and I'm trying to convince Francis and I need your it's assistance. This Toyota minivan? In, in, in there is a Toyota is minivan. Yeah. Dude, there's a Toyota from ninety three. Cole, Cole needs a key no, truck. It's a Volkswagen. For real. Five speed Volkswagen bus okay. with camper top. Yeah, West, and the back, a Westphalia? It's a Westphalia. The back seats are facing each other with a table in the middle. Yeah. My kids would fit. Uh, My buddy from college has one. And it's he, so he, cute. He's, he's taken it literally all over the country. He's gone to like uh, Yellowstone, and then in the next year he went to Maine with this camper. Look at this 1961 C10. Okay. With a 4BT Cummins diesel swap. Oh, I'm down. It's. Gorgeous. On a 79 Suburban yeah. frame with dually one-ton axles. Yeah. We'd have to fix some rust on the body. I, I am seeing no negatives here. Do you, do you yeah. hear it? Freaking little four-cylinder diesel. That's, it's not, it, it's not a powerhouse. No. But it's chuggy. It's probably got like double or triple the amount of torque as it does as Look of that. horsepower probably. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. You, <clears throat> you can tow like whatever that. as long as you got time to like get that. there. <laughs> 256 <laughs> foot pounds of torque. So it's not it's not huge, but it's a tiny little motor. You you should get Look at that stuffed in there. Oh, that is cool. Oh my gosh. So so no on the key truck, you I haven't even got a response on I don't know. If you could right, give me a diesel key truck. What just buy one and Susan it diesel? And do whatever you want. Put 12 do. valves in it. <laughs> You know, one of them Cummins, you know, one them. Cummings. I want to, I want to keep trucks super bad. Run a pee pump. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, that's, that's what it is. It's a pee pump. It's a pee pump. I'm concerned. I might not fit though. I've never been in one. Yeah. That's why I'm concerned. When I got uh, the last, uh, what was that? Like a little Toyota Hilux looks so, yeah, yeah. It looks so cool. I can't fit. My knees are by my freaking chin. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like the little international, what are they? Like scouts? Yeah. The smaller ones. I don't fit. I'm so bummed. My grandpa had one and I wanted one and 
we just cut the, well, cut the floorboards out. He's like 5'10". He's how, like a normal person. How tall are you? 6'4". Six, six, four. Four. Are you really? Yeah. 6'5 yeah. with mean. boots on. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I never noticed that you were that tall. <laughs> Your personality really shrinks yeah. you down. Yeah, I'm unassuming. Let me just... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <Yeah>. so <laughs> Brett. Sorry. Sorry, Evan. <laughs> uh, for anybody in Indiana, there is a calendar on the IBA website. There are events going on every Saturday all around the state. It's amazing. Go and check those out. And Beautiful. in June, they will be doing the uh, annual meetup in Tipton at mm-hmm. the, the fairgrounds. Big Tipton Conference. Yeah, big Tipton Conference. Big. That was the first like big black event. That's I where I met to. you. See, I definitely remember yeah. that. No, uh, they had. Uh, <laughs> Are you sure? Yes. I thought I met you with David. No, I met you. I met you first at the at, at Tipton. We were making fun of all of the old guard that was watching the demonstration in the front row in the asleep. launchers, and they were all asleep. They were all asleep. Anyway, so Brett, Secret back to the, to right, the thing at task. hand. So we've got uh, we've got a class with you coming up. Yes. What are the dates for that, Mister Evan, Producer Evan? Uh, uh, April thirteenth. April thirteenth. Yeah. You are doing a, so it's just a one day class. Right. It's an intro introductory class. Uh, So intro to bladesmithing though, right? Yes. yes. Knife making. Trying to get people up to speed to where they're comfortable, like in their own shop, making knives. Yep. Yep. So everything you learn that day is everything that you will hopefully use for years to come. Right. And you'll just work on that process and refine them. Like the knife we're making is basically every knife that every knife maker like has in their pocket. Yeah, sure. It's just a, uh, an EDC knife. Yeah. And, uh. Little fixed blade. Yeah, you're not, experience you're not doing tells that. me. Experience tells me that, um, you know, I could build a big Bowie knife and charge hundreds of dollars for it, right. and then never sell it. Sure. Or you can make an EDC knife and charge like a reasonable amount of money for it, and, right. and sell those all day long. Right. So Greg, well, that's a great example of that. Yeah, for sure. Greg just makes little sixty, seventy dollars and goes off on farmers markets like one hundred percent. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> no, that's awesome. So, will you be doing what kind of steel you're going to be using? Is it going to be primarily hand forging, or are you going to be using any equipment? What are you um, thinking? Well, I wanted to talk to you about some of that. Um, for forging the finger weld, yeah, I usually use a bottom tool because it forms it beautifully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's less grinding later. Right. But you don't have any bottom tools in your school. And I know that some of That's your- That's about to change. <laughs> good. I noticed that some of your hardy holes are like two inches and then some of them are <laughs> no, like- One and three quarter. Yeah, yeah, one and three yeah, quarter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, three yeah, quarter. They're, 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 giant, they're giant. They're very large. Um, and I have a 430 pound- German double horn and mm-hmm. it's like an inch and a quarter. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know if you have that here. I don't know. I thought maybe this afternoon I'd make a bunch of that stuff just for Wonderful. the class. Fantastic. That, that way the sorry. That way the um, yes. That way the students have that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or the alternative would be would use like um, the sixteen ton right. with one of the fullering dies coming from the top pushing yep. down onto a flat plate. Yep. Mm-hmm. Just and to that, get that may be well. easier too because one of the things that I find often and you I don't know how many beginner classes you've done but when I'm working with a beginner I always like to start them off by hand and then right as we're getting to the exhausting part of the process move yeah. them over to the power tool and they're like. Oh, like I had a guy out at my shop, at my home shop, and we were forging uh, like little, little kitchen knives together. And I had had him hand hammering. And this is not somebody that's an an experience. That's why he's there for the class. And you want him to own all the Zen. I want him to own the whole pain of the process. (laughs) And then right at the, at the end, I was like, oh, by the way, we'll we'll finish this off. And I had a a bevel shear die in my press and we just put it on there and cut it perfectly. You get this wonderful tapered edge. And he was like, oh, Oh." you had this the whole time? (laughs) Well, (laughs) that was so much easier. I was like, yeah. Nathan, you dick. (laughs) (laughs) So I think, uh, you know, we, and we will, we've got tons of fuller dies and stuff too that we can set up in the presses. And yeah. if we compare those with inductions and you just move, oh gosh, you could move through that process so yeah. quick. So yeah. I, I don't Nathan know. Nathan is making this your problem instead of ours. Well, that's fine. I'm used to that. <laughs> it, uh, seriously, I don't, I don't care. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to, I figure with an intro class, it's better off starting them with fundamentals yeah. And like getting them swinging a hammer confidently, right? Then like yeah, 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 you suck at that. Let's now move to like, <laughs> let's move to hydraulic presses or pneumatic yeah. hammers or something. And it's just like nah, yeah. just do it by hand. The the problem is though that you can't teach someone how to swing a hammer. In that a day. is true. It takes three or four months of consistent yeah. practice, and so you can give them like the theory, 
right, of, right, of proper right. ham, hand hammering. But then their muscle memory and all that stuff has to be built up over a significant time. My grandpa used to send me out back with a four by four in a box of nails. And he mm-hmm. said, when you bring this back, I don't want to see any wood. And so I would just sit there and like, I did that to my daughter. You should. Yeah. It's good for them. <laughs> you know how, I mean, uh, hand hammering is something I use every day. My ability to smack something where I want to hit it, mm-hmm. it. That's a vital part of being a, like, that's a part of the uh, society. <laughs> the, the treatise <laughs> that I give people when they're working, I'm like, listen, you need to either, either slow down yeah. to where you're accurate yeah. or use a lighter hammer. Sure. Because people like, especially guys are like, Oh, yeah. you know, go grab this four or five pound hammer. I'm like, yeah. you got to swing that all day, bro. That's not yeah. going to go well. For you. <laughs> <laughs> and it is light the first few hits. Yeah. 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 Right. An hour from now we'll talk. Right. Well, when you start seeing them, I'll, I'll see, especially in, and I do this with kids, my kids included, they'll be over there swinging and their wrist yeah. starts giving out and they're just <laughs> dropping it down. And I'm like, <laughs> Hey, let me get you a smaller hammer. Right. No. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, no, but we are. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's going to be uh, April thirteenth. April wonderful, 13th. and yes. that's going to be our single day class. Yep. So that's going to be super. So if you guys have any questions about that, go to coalschool dot com yeah. or coaliron dot com. Uh, where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, they can find me on my Facebook page, um, and they can find me at Instagram at Burning Sky Forge at Burning Sky Forge. Yeah, wonderful. The the things that I'm going to be going over in A the lot class of filters here. Yeah, well, sorry. That's, that's his older stuff. That's my old stuff, man. That's, that's back when filters were cool. Had that's like bit. years that was back and years in the ago. 60s. Yeah. There's probably a lot of running stuff and a bunch of nerd there stuff. Was. In there was. I saw lots of pictures yeah. of you in mirrors oh, look looking yeah. freaking jacked. Which, mirrors. by the way, you look fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's why you had me sit next to him. <laughs> I'm not six feet. He looks much better. <laughs> six uh, five with boots. Yeah. Um, the things that we're going to be learning in that class. They're not necessarily like pragmatic. You have to do them this way. Right. But they need to understand like, I'm kind of lazy. So this is the most efficient way possible sure. I have found for us to get to this finish line right. of what we want to do. Right. And I'm not one of those guys where I'm going to be correcting how they're swinging the hammer like sure. every other swing or I'm going to be riding people. There's none of that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, the IBA, especially certain groups, if you don't swing the hammer the way that they feel is efficient or proper, then they're going to take away whatever it is that you're working on. <laughs> you're going to have to sit there and swing that hammer until you can prove yourself that, yeah, yeah. I, I can listen yeah. to what you're telling me. Yeah. But we're, yeah. Not, we're not doing that. But, sure. Um, so I, I've worked with a lot of people and I'm trying to express on them, like, we're doing it the easiest way possible. Yeah. And they just want to make it hard. <laughs> I'm like, well, we're not making a sword out of a pipe wrench today. I'm yeah. sorry. You know, you need to work on a six inch knife. And then when we're done with that. You need to make like 30 of those before you right. move to making a right. pipe wrench sword. But a lot of people just don't, <laughs> they, they don't get that. Yeah. Quantity in this case begets creates quality. or begets yeah. quality. Yeah. You know, yeah. you got to get the reps in. Yep. I remember <clears> recently <throat> we butchered some pigs and I had a friend of mine that I thought had butchered pigs before and I called him and he was coming over to help and he was like, yeah, so we'll like, we'll get him, we'll get him down. We'll get him bled. Uh, we'll get the guts out and, and get him hung up. And then where are we taking him? I was like, what do you mean? Where am I taking him? He's like, well, what, what butcher are we taking him to? I was like, brother, yeah, we're taking them here. <laughs> we are the butchers. And there was this long pause on the phone and he was like, huh? <laughs> and I was like, oh, do you, do you not know how to butcher? No, I no. don't. It's like, okay. So we, wow. going back to the beginners, I'm a beginner. I'd never butchered a hog before. You know, I had this ideal version of what we were going right. to do. Yeah. He has butchered. He's probably butchered a hundred hogs, but he butchers feral hogs in a barn and they drop them, hang them, grind up the meat. Cause they, you know, they don't do cuts and stuff out of those. A lot of the meat's oh. unedible. Mm-hmm. So they grind everything. And the, it, and then they just toss whatever's left. They grind unedible. In-edible? No, it's well, not. So it's too tough to eat as its own cut. So they grind it into sausage. Oh, just they're about really lean. Yeah. And they yeah. When you buy feral hog, it's going to be sausage. Okay. I don't know. Can you even buy feral hog? I. But they go not out around in here. You can't with machine guns. Yeah. And kill hogs. <laughs> Is this in Texas at yes. night with yeah with with like, night vision with night and, and literal mini wow. guns? Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. Because they're invasive. It looks wonderful. <gasps> oh. Yeah. So, yeah, no, he had some great meat, but he he just, we were so underwater trying to figure out how to do cuts and yeah. stuff. And so the first day when we did the, 
what what I'm getting at is his <laughs> idea of getting the hog down, getting mm-hmm. it bled, getting it gutted, getting it hung and skinned. That was what we did the first day. And by the end of it, I was like, dude, I've learned so much. This has been such an yeah. amazing process. So you're totally, totally like, stoked. Oh, yeah, and I used one of your giant cleavers and <laughs> just took fantastic. the head right. We had it hung up, you know, and, and gutted. And I just swung right through that noggin. And We're going to have the head head an oh, age yeah. rating on One this, swing. This podcast. <laughs> Whammy. And uh, my kids were standing there. They're like, whoa, you know, I've, Millie's got blood splatter across <laughs> her face. And uh, oh my goodness. And my kids love that stuff, though. And, and so <laughs> we got through that process. <laughs> and I was like so enthralled. If we had stopped there, if I had listened to my teacher, yeah. I would have been like over the moon. Because mm-hmm. lear- I learned so much. And I got to see the meat. I got to look at all the stuff, all yeah. that stuff. It was amazing. I got to look at the liver and like, those were really healthy pigs. Then day two was butchering and it was about 13, 14 hours oh, of wow. absolute mediocrity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my cuts are really bad. We used a sawzall to split the pig. Uh, I tried to use the cleaver, but I couldn't, I was so slippery yeah, because though I, we had lard hogs that I I would hit, I was trying to go down the spine, right? And I I was just I I had never done it before, so I yeah. wasn't good at it yet. So we ended up using the sawzall to finish them out. And there were a couple spots that the the cleaver gave me a much cleaner slice through, and then I could get the sawzall in to finish the split. Okay, and uh, but my cuts were all over the place because I'm bad at it. I've never done it before. So when we were processing ribs and all that stuff, it was. There's a lot yeah. of pieces of meat or uh, sorry, pieces of bone, because if I'd used the cleaver, oh. it would have been great. But because I use a sawzall, you get all these little particles of bone everywhere and you got to wash it out. And anyway, I wish I had taken his advice and, and done, done it, it somewhere. you know, set parameters around. This is your first time. Don't yeah. try to do the fricking, don't reinvent you know, the wheel, right? Don't try to make a sword out of a pipe, pipe wrench or whatever. It's like, <laughs> Trust right. me, here's where we need to start. And then you can build up to the complexity and, and all that. I recently sold the cleaver to a guy up in Kalamazoo, mm-hmm. Chester's Wild Meat. Okay. He has a mobile butchering. Oh, that's so he, he just comes to your house and yeah. butchers your animals. I need that. And he sent me a video of him splitting, I don't know, like four hogs in yeah. half with the cleaver. Yep. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a, it's a good cleaver. Sweet. Yeah, there's some of our meat. That was a lot. <laughs> Ended up taking us three days, actually. So those are... Uh, whatever, hams, hawks, shoulders. What is that? It's pork. <laughs> and it is the <laughs> best pork I have ever had. I bet. Oh my gosh. You know, it's just like you get farm fresh eggs. Oh yeah. And you have an egg and it's like yep. this bright yellow and you're like, yep. holy cow. When it sits up out. in the pan. Yeah. Yep. Well, and it's it so much different than like buying absolutely. an industrial egg. Yeah. You put it and it turns to rip, like soup in the bowl. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, our eggs. What, one of the fun things that we're having right now is uh, we've got a couple new layers and I've got a couple really mature layers. The mature layers are giving us these giant double yolks and then the new fresh layers are giving these tiny little quail eggs, which are perfect. Why did you use the little voice? So, so <laughs> on Saturdays. So every Saturday I make the kids, uh, I t- make them sourdough and I cut the center there, out. There they are. There they are. It's the size of a thumb. So you you cut the center out of your toast. Okay. You you butter the pan, put the toast in, break the little quail egg. (laughs) Toad in a hole. (laughs) Toad in a hole. I don't freaking know. But my kids love it. And then you fry it up, you know? That sounds awesome. It's so awesome. But if you use a full size egg, it's too big. So the little quail Just make the hole bigger. Is it it just because it's (laughs) the species? Or is it because it's- No, it's because of age and maturity. No, they're They're chickens. They're fresh. They're both chickens. (laughs) Right. Okay. (laughs) Thank you, Francis. Thanks, Francis. You've contributed so much. You're like a really rally. You're it. a rally killer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Mr. Producer Evan, was there anything else you wanted to cover today in our beautiful initial introductory interview of Monsieur Alnique? How do you say your last name? <laughs> Did you just say like it was French? Alnique? Uh, no, it's on. Oh, eh, technically, it's like you pronounce it like onion. It's the same vowel. Onion? Onic? Yeah. On- Onic. Onic. Yeah. Onic. yeah. Like there's a Pokemon from a Pokemon days called Onyx. Onyx. That's the best. It's also it's a, a big, color. Big it, rock It, it gets confused often with every variation thereof. So it's, it's Dutch. I was raised by um, Dutch people who immigrated for like through New York, 
uh, through Pennsylvania. Oh, that's awesome. Into Holland, Michigan. Yep. And then they took a boat across Lake Michigan to okay. w- where my parents still live. Hmm. Wisconsin. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, on yeah. the eastern shore. Yeah. I'm sorry. On the western shore of Wisconsin. Okay. The, their house is on a hill and it overlooks the lake. Oh my gosh. And uh, it's really beautiful. Yeah. The only thing I don't like about it is one, it's always freezing cold. And and two, it's always windy where they're at. Oh yeah. So I'm sure. Right on the yeah. lake, you can watch the coal freighters go up and down and that's stuff. That's super it's, cool. It's really a neat area. I want to go I to grew up on the I, I grew up on the beach there. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Um, cause it's an icy cold beach. Yeah. Right? You never yeah. go, you never go swimming cause the water temperature is like 58 degrees. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. yeah. That's like good being stuff. From Finland. What? Like being from Finland. <laughs> a lot of water. It's cold. Man, this has been a wonderful interview today. Thank you guys so much for listening. Check out coleschool.com for Brett's amazing class. We are really looking forward to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming today. (laughs) Why was that? (laughs) That was a great ending. That was super good. It makes it sound like you have something against Finnish people. No, I love Finnish people. I felt like you were denigrating. No, that's just...